Well, welcome to today's session. Uh, my name is Kelsey and I'm the warehouse manager here at YYC Growers and Distributors. We're a farmer-owned cooperative that works to ensure local and fresh veggies get to Calgary and Southern Alberta residents um, and make sure that they get access to really good food on a weekly or a bi-weekly basis. Um, if you've never heard of us, you can visit yycgrowers.com to learn a bit more. Um, and I also have a discount code at the end of this chat. So if people want to uh, hang on till the end, I'll give you a discount code if you're subscribing for the first time. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that we are situated on Treaty 7 territory, um, which is the traditional territory of the Kainai, Pekani, Tsitsika, Tutsina, and the Stony Nakoda, uh, Wesley, Bears Pond, Chiniki Nations, and the Métis Nation of Region 3. Uh, I'd just like to acknowledge these groups as we wouldn't be able to farm or live on this land or produce food um, without their ongoing stewardship. And uh, as we head into this weekend, um, just think about how you interact with the land and how you want to nurture that relationship with us. Um, but thank you for coming to this education series. Uh, today we are joined by Michael. Hi, Michael. <laughs> Um, so Michael's from Dirt Boys uh, Urban Farming, and we're very excited to have you here in this virtual space. Um, so how are you doing today, Michael? Doing good. Doing it's good? Uh, the last super hot day, hopefully, for a little bit. So that's nice. <laughs> that is nice. Our, we were just talking about Michael's spinach and how everyone's hoping it doesn't bolt. Um, so that's, that's something that we're fingers crossed for. Um, but do you want to introduce yourself and uh, maybe how you got into urban farming? Sure. So I'm Michael Gavin. I run Dirt Boys Urban Farming. Um, Dirt Boys is a spin model farm. So we work in mostly backyards or smaller plots of land that people have donated or some agreement has been made. And I farm veggies for YOC growers. Um, and then I also farm veggies for a little smaller CSA that I run myself. Um, and I also do some garden building and consulting in like kind of spring, fall and a bit in the summer. Um, how I got into urban farming, um, I farmed a little bit in BC for a while and then I came back to Calgary and I just wanted to get to do more farming and I heard about urban farming and I talked to Rod here um, and we had a nice talk about stuff and then he kind of connected me a little bit to Dennis who is the founder of Dirt Boys um and he was looking for someone to take over and everything kind of just went from there so that's kind of how it all started awesome so how many years have you been uh kind of doing dirt boys and running dirt boys for so this will be the second year running dirt boys um and then i farmed for a year before that as well so. any lessons from your first summer growing in calgary <laughs> lots of lessons <laughs> lots of things um I mean, there, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of different things um, to think about. I think an important thing, though, is just to take care of yourself as much as you take care of your plants. And uh, yeah, that's an important lesson. <laughs> that is a very good lesson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So today we're going to be talking about no dig farming. So for starters, what is no dig farming? Yeah, so no dig farming is a type of regenerative agriculture. There's lots of different things you can do under that umbrella term. Um, this is just one of them. Um, and it folk, it's a no-till system, so no tillage in the soil, um, very minimal soil disturbance. Um, and it works to try and build carbon in the soil and increase your nutrient and soil or your water capacity and a bunch of other things. Um, and there's a few different kind of principles that are core to it, which we can talk about next if we want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You want to dive right into the three principles of uh, sure. no dig farming? Yeah. So there's no real particular order or hierarchy for these. They're all important. Uh, I'll just say them as I say them, though. Um, so the first and most obvious one is no digging, no tilling. Um, so you want to minimize your soil disturbance as much as you can. So no tilling. Obviously, there are exceptions to this, like... If you're taking out a rhizomal weed, you have to dig a little bit because there's no other way to get it out. Um, if you're transplanting something, you're going to dig open little holes. But by and large, you want to reduce as much soil disturbance and mixing of the soil as you can. Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. Um, 
The second thing would be to keep your soil covered as much as you can. So bare soil that's baking in the sun and getting blasted by wind is kind of dead soil in a little way. And so you want to keep that covered as much as you can. Um, ideally, you want to have that covered with living photosynthetic plants that are shading the soil and are on top. But in Canada or Calgary, um, we can't do that all year round. So other parts of the season, you need to be covering it with other things, um, whether that be a mulch like straw or wood or something, or it could be, um, or it could be something like a plastic tarp, um, which I use in the winters more so, um, just to keep your soil covered and to keep that life alive underneath. And then, can you see this? Everyone see that picture? Uh, yeah, that's that's what I would do in the winter mostly, or if I was prepping a new plot. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I think the other picture is of like the actual farm when there's stuff growing. I might have a better example. Um, so obviously the soil is all covered. So in the pathways, you've got wood mulch, which is keeping your pathways covered and keeping some kind of life, mycelium, other things growing underneath there. And then in the beds, you have a nice dense planting of plants, which have leaves covering. And to the side of that, you can see there's like some tomato plants that aren't as covered on the soil. I will use things like straw mulch on plants like that more often. Um, to try and keep as much soil cover as we can. But yeah, that's kind of kind of it. That like bare soil on the right side is like a transition phase. So that's that's why that's not covered. But in general, you want to keep things covered as much as you can. So that's the second one. And the third kind of main principle is a really important one, which a lot of people don't do, which is keeping the roots of your plants in the soil. So whenever I harvest something, like say that kohlrabi there on the right side, I just cut the base of the plant as close to the soil as I can and take off the top and leave that root in. Because when you pull that root out, you're disrupting all the structure that's been built in the soil. You're pulling some carbon out um, and you're kind of just doing your soil a disservice. So those are the three kind of principles, the main principles that you try to follow in a no-dig system. Cool. Um, I actually have a friend who we were talking about some no dig stuff and he was saying he has like in his yard because he's been doing some construction the the soil is so compacted because he's been walking on it so much and building stuff on it um, but is curious how does like get that to like start to come back to life do you have any like yeah so when I prep like a, a bed in the season um, there's a tool I would use that breaks up Mostly it's your subsoil compaction that you're wanting to break up and it's called a broad fork. But basically it's just like a giant pitchfork um, with really long, really long tines. And you just stick that in and you crack the soil, but you don't break the soil all the way so that it turns. Like when you pitchfork a soil, you're kind of flipping it over. We don't want to be doing that, right? That's our tilling. So you just want to stick it in and kind of crack the soil open and that opens the aeration and kind of just loosens up that structure. So that would be one thing. And then if it's going to eventually be a garden space, applying compost on that and converting it to the no dig system where you're slowly building that soil structure over time. Mm -hmm. Cool, 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 yeah. cool. You can also use a pitchfork the same way you use a broad fork. Just, just stick it in and crack it open, but without mixing it, so. Um. And uh, why is no-dig farming important for soil health? You talked about um, leaving the roots in um, and only taking the part of the plant that you need and leaving the soil covered. But yeah, why is it so important to keep healthy soil? So soil is, I guess, the life of everything. Um, and it's if we're talking about regenerative agriculture, it's our best carbon sink we can work with. Um, and so if you're following practices like no dig and other regenerative agriculture, you're actually able to capture and store carbon in the soil, um, and therefore reducing greenhouse emissions, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So roots, for instance, if you take those roots out, you're breaking the soil open when you pull them out and that off gases some carbon, but you're also taking carbon that was going to decompose and stay in the soil 
and you're taking it out and you know doing whatever with it uh, maybe you're composting which is maybe not too bad but um so you're doing that <clears throat> and when you break the structure and you break um your soil open you end up killing a lot of microbes and a lot of other microorganisms that are helping to break down and to store carbon in your soil and create a better system overall um, like it increases the water capacity in your soil so you don't need to use as much water and a bunch of other things so yeah cool and then when did like no dig farming become a super important part of your farming practice Has it always yeah been so <laughs> it's kind of always been that way but when i worked on some farms in bc um they did kind of the more traditional market gardener approach, which is tilling and just using organic um, like fertilizers and things. So like slow release organic fertilizers. And for me, that was still just not really going far enough. Um, it's kind of the sustainable phase where we're staying at where, where we're at, which is not great. We need to be getting better, right? Um, and so no dig was a way to be changing the trajectory to a regenerative system where we're actually really taking care of the soil for not just us, but for the future and for everything else as part of it, as opposed to just taking care of it enough that we can get at what we want, um, which I found a lot of other farms, lots of different practices they did. were still kind of just in that sustainable mindset. Yeah, and I think that's something that Rod talks about all the time too as well. He's like, you can't just work to like meet the status quo. A lot of the times it's just making sure that that carbon is getting taken in and stored um, because with the UN, I think they said there's only 60 years of topsoil left. So one thing about no dig farming is you're actually helping to regenerate the soil and building topsoil um, kind of actively, which is, which is super important. Um, yeah. And I don't know if everyone knows this, but Michael has a background in like pollination and ecology. Um, so for no dig farming, how does it positively affect the ecology in your farms, like pollinators and creepy crawlies? Have you noticed a difference? Uh, yeah, so creepy crawlies, um, there's a difference in for sure, um, because I use a lot of wood mulch in my pathways and I'll leave a lot of plant debris in my beds. Um, so like after, I harvest something like kohlrabi, for instance, which the leaves I don't typically give out to people. Um, I just give out the bulb. So I cut the leaves off and leave those in the bed to decompose for however long they can until I need to go plant that bed again. Um, so there's creeper crawlies and things that like that. They use that as habitat. Beetles in particular um, really like sitting under mulch and under the tarps and under other things like that. Um, so that's creating space and habitat for them. Um, and then other assets that aren't aspects that aren't necessarily no dig are more for pollinators. Um, so planting flowers, uh, this year I'm probably going to plant some berry bushes, um, stuff like that is kind of more on the pollinator side and creating like bee homes and I guess just the ecosystem at large, um, trying to create a pretty healthy, um, robust system. Because the healthier your soil is, the healthier your insects populations are going to be. It all kind of expands outwards, right? So the better your food's going to taste. The better know. your food's going to taste. You know, everything <laughs> just coming together. Uh, <laughs> everything just works. Um, yeah. And then also with um, a lot of like fungi that are underneath yes. the ground, like for no dig farming, like why is that important for? for yeah. Them? So um, one part that you often don't think about when you think about pathways, for instance, it, and how I, why I use mulch, wood mulch in my pathways. When you think of a grassland system or like a forest system, those are very different in terms of what's on the ground. Um, like in a forested system, you're having more wood, more debris on the ground, whereas a grassland, it's just grasses and other shrubs and things like that. And Farming is kind of weird because we want to be mimicking more of a grass system, grassland system, because we have annual vegetables. But at the same time, I want to trick the soil into thinking it's more in a succession forest phase because then I'm not going to get weed pressure. 
Um, and so having mulch pathways um, kind of tricks the soil into thinking that, and the mycelium presence will trick plants, seeds, and things into thinking, oh, we're more a forest system here. And so we're not going to get as much weed germination, less weed pressure. Also, mycelium are great for moving nutrients around and helping water move around. So, I mean, this after that last rainfall during this hot period, I had a whole bunch of inky cap mushrooms popping up all over my farm um, and a few other mushrooms popping up as well. So, yeah, we want to always support that. Nice. I didn't know that mycelium can trick grasslands into thinking they're in the forest. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So mulch, especially you're saying like mulch and straw are kind of the best way to to kind of keep the weeds down, but also teach the fungi. Yeah, to, to feed the fungi. Yeah, wood mulch is like a really carbony source is the best thing for fungi. Um, straw is good too, but it tends to be a little bit drier. I kind of use that more just as a cover for the soil, whereas the mulch is really feeding the soil. Cool. Um, and I'm going to share a picture with everyone <laughs> and ask you the question, Michael, what are you doing in this picture? So in that picture, I am seeding stuff. That yellow contraption with the wheels is the Jang cedar. It's a very excellent cedar. If anyone wants to farm, it's the best one. <laughs> um, yeah, so right there I'm seeding and you can see there, there's uh, mulch in the pathways. Again, that's kind of the system I use everywhere. Um, yeah, I'm seeding. So you know how like when people are like transplanting stuff into the ground or planting, they'll like till up an oh, area yeah. and then like plant into it. So how is this any different? So um, pretty much every year I'll apply, most years I'll apply like an inch or two of fresh compost and just layer that on top, I'm not digging it in, not tilling it in, um, letting the worms and, and things do that. Um, but how I prep a bed because you only, in no dig, you don't want to be disturbing your lower layers because you want that to build and create its natural structure and system. But the very top, think in the grassland system, things are going to be running around, trampling, moving that around. The very top, like inch or two, is totally fine to disturb because that's kind of what naturally would happen. So when I prep a spot, I'll use this tool called the chicken feet. I call it a chicken feet uh, because we're mimicking a chicken foot. Um, but it's basically just a little kind of tilther thing and it just breaks up the very top little bit of the soil and then I'll rake that smooth. Just thousands of chickens running along. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what we're, we're pretending to do. Um, but yeah, so like the longer you, the more you do a no dig system, the better your soil is going to become in terms of compaction and the difficulties that people face when they do tillage and why they continue to need to do tillage. Um, because every time you till, you're breaking up your structure again. You're letting that rain fall, knock around particles, and make your soil denser. Um, and the more you do it, the kind of harder it gets to get away from. So no dig, you're you're working the opposite direction, basically. Hmm. Um, and with that, I guess if people are interested in kind of moving towards no dig, like in their backyard or at their own homes, like what are the first steps? Like how do they start? So it depends. So there's a few different ways I would make a new plot. Um, so if the plot was, like if you had a backyard garden and it's in pretty decent shape in terms of like weeds. And when I say weeds specifically, I'm talking about weeds that have deep roots or rhizomal roots like grasses and things like dandelions or creeping bluebell, for instance, which is terrible. Um, ones like those, <clears throat> you need to do the work to get them out. Um, basically, when I would make a new plot, I try to wipe it clean almost and kind of restart, restart the plot as a no-dig one. So for instance, you have a garden, you have a bunch of grass in it. Um, I would go through with a pitchfork and this is when we're going to be digging at the very beginning, the first time you make it. Go through, dig, and get those grass roots out, every single one. And then from then on, transition to a no-dig system and don't do any more digging. So basically, it's pretty simple, though, what you want to do. So you have a plot. If you have the time, you can put some cardboard down 
and then compost on top of that and let it decompose. But if you're wanting to get planting right away, just a nice thick layer of compost, like six to eight inches deep is what you want to start with. And then you can probably wait a year or two before reapplying. And that's going to help smother out any weed seeds that are popping up. Um, and it's going to give you a good basis um, for your soil to start kind of regenerating. So this is how I'd make a new plot if I had a lot of time. So I would put a tarp over the plot and I would kill out all the grass by a lack of sunlight. It's called oculation. And any other things that are underneath there, so they'll all try to sprout and germinate and grow. And they'll hit the tarp, not be able to get any sunlight and die off. And so I'll leave that on for, depending on the time of season, one to two to three months to really kill stuff off. And then I would follow that up with a layer of cardboard, like we can see in the picture here. And then after that, I would do the layer of mulch and compost, again, like six to eight inches deep to really give you a good start, uh, which I think we're going to see in this picture. Okay, yeah. So that's taking the tarp off. You can see all this dead grass here and then starting to apply the cardboard. You're muted right now, I can't hear you. Sorry, I said, what picture would you like next? Uh, is, did I send you the end one where it's mulch and uh, compost? I might not have. No, I think I have the one of the garden at the end. Like the okay. Yeah, but yeah, so that's basically the process. Um, if you have the, if you have like a kind of ready to go plot, you can get it going quick. If you have a really bad plot or one that you're totally remaking, tarping it for a period to kill off things is a good way because that way you're also leaving all of those plants, all of that carbon, all of that nutrients in the soil when you tarp it, as opposed to if you, for instance, cut out all the sod on your lawn and took it away somewhere else. You're taking out a huge amount of carbon and good stuff um, when you do that. So if you can just leave that there and kill it all and let it break down, that's the best. That's the money. That's the money. <laughs> get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, so if anyone has any questions, feel free to un unmute yourself and, and ask Michael. We're going to go into some fun question periods um, if you're interested in doing it in your own home or whatever. Um, yeah, if anyone have any questions for Michael, feel free. Um, Rod has a question. Where do you get your tarps from that you use for covering? Yeah. So when you want to cover a space, you want to use a tarp that blocks out all the sunlight, obviously. So like your typical like blue Home Depot tarp is not going to do that um, unless you put like six of them on top of each other. Um, so any tarp that can block the sunlight will do. Um, I get a silage tarp. I get silage tarps. So they're black on one side, white on the other side. Um, and they're really thick. I think they're six millimeters thick. Um, and they're UV treated, so they should last a long time. Um, I get them online from a place called Dubois Agriculture. They're in Quebec. Um, I'm sure there are places you can find them in Alberta, but I don't know any off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, that's where I would get them. Okay. Um, are you seeing that question? Do you want me to read it? Okay, Cecile. Uh, says, sure, you, you can okay. read it. So she said, I started a new garden plot on top of existing grass. I didn't tarp it though. Um, I just added about two layers of cardboard and eight inches of compost mix on top, planning on mulching the paths too. Um, is there something you suggest for mitigating grass growth even more? And has she made a huge mistake? <laughs> when, when, when did you uh, first cover it was it really early spring or like middle of the seat was the grass growing green when you first covered it or not yet just yeah. yesterday okay <laughs> <laughs> well you put a lot of material on which is good um so that that will help to smother it but i i assume you're going to get some grass regrowing through um yeah if there isn't quack grass which it probably is though um yeah, the good good eight inches is, is terrific, um, but you're probably going to get some stuff popping through. I always, even still with the tarping, I'll get the odd piece popping up. When you do have that piece pop up, you immediately, you want to dig as far down and follow that root as far down as you can go and get to the very bottom of it and pop it out. 
Um, cover cropping would help or not much. Um, I mean, the grass is going to grow up through the cover crop. So that wouldn't help in terms of stopping grass growth. Um, but you put a good layer of stuff on, so that should help a lot in mitigating um, any grass growing through. But whatever, like be really diligent. As soon as you see that little blade of grass popping out through the dirt, you hunt it down and you follow it. Like intense weeding. Intense, yeah. <laughs> Do you have like rage metal as you're <laughs> trying to get it all up? <laughs> and there's a tool called a hori hori knife, which I would suggest is a very good one. It's like a basically a little knife. It's not very sharp. Um, and you can use it to like really follow roots down. Or pitchfork is your next best friend for getting roots out. Okay. And then Megan, did you have a question? Yes. Yes, I do have a question. Um, so I've started, uh, I've already started my garden for this year. So, mm -hmm. uh, but I'd like to transition it into a no dig plot in the future. And I have it right here in front of me. So I wonder if I could just show you what I have and get sure. some advice on the next steps. It's really bright. It's hard for me to figure out what to do with my video. So hopefully you can kind of see it. Okay. So it was covered. It was a garden years ago. It was covered for about like 10 plus years. We uncovered it. We did till it. I've started putting things down um, and things are growing. Um, what mm -hmm. should I do next to start preparing to transfer it to no-till? So um, when you do start a new no-dig garden, sometimes you can do like a kickstart till to get, mm -hmm. get things going and kind of break up those weeds. And, but mm -hmm. so from now on, those three principles are kind of what you want to follow, right? So don't do any more tilling except yeah. for like absolutely necessary to get out you know, those weeds, um, yeah. keep your plant roots in. So whenever you come to harvest those things, just clip yeah. them off. They might grow back a little bit again. Just keep clipping them down if you want. Yeah. And then try and keep as much soil coverage as possible. So in the winter, when you're done, when it's, it's the off season, cover it with straw or a tarp or something to keep the soil covered. Um, and then as much as you can in the season, especially when yeah. it's blazing hot like this, um, if you can put some mulch on or, you know, living plants, ideally again. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I should, uh, I was thinking I should put some cardboard down at least on the pathways I've left in between my rows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's always good to have yeah. the paths because the paths can be that living zone, even when your beds are empty. So yeah. like in my, my farming, I'll have empty beds at certain points in the period and I'll cover those up, but they're kind of, there's not much activity going on in those while they're mostly empty. So if you have stuff in your pathways, whether a living pathway or a mulch pathway or whatever it is, you're yeah. still keeping some activity. It's kind of like a refuge that they can go into the pathway and then they can go back out into your beds. Oh, beautiful. So yeah. one last question then, um, what could I put in the pathway to have a living pathway? And can I start that right now? So I actually don't super like living pathways because the thing you would normally put in them is like a white clover, like a dwarf white clover that's really small. Oh, yeah. um, it just spreads a lot and gets into your yeah. beds and it can be tricky to get out. Yeah. Um, but that would be typically the thing most people put in um, into their pathways. I don't know if there's other things that people use for living pathways. Do you know, Rod? Much else like rye maybe? I don't even know. Yeah, winter rye. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Yeah. And then white clover, I think is often, but I was also going to say that, uh, you know, to the pictures that Michael had, um, he gets that bark mulch free from local tree companies. And so that's always an option. Yeah. Uh, and it really does provide, like every time I use bark mulch, um, the, the, the worm activity, mm -hmm. um, it just goes off the chart and worm, worms are kind of like the, the top of the pyramid in mm -hmm. under the soil. So if you've got, if if you've got lots of uh, worms, that no, that means you've got <clears throat> a great kind of colony of bacteria and fungi as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, good. There was at least a few worms when I started, so hopefully I didn't completely. You build it and they will come. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. Yep. Okay. Anyone else have any questions for Michael? A big one. Ooh, shall I read it out loud? I love it. Sure, okay. Yeah. Um, so Jill, uh, I just moved into an apartment, so I had to transfer everything to planters. 
I like your recommendation of leaving the roots in the ground, but do you think I'll be able to leave the roots in the planters when I clean everything up at the end of the summer? My largest planter, for example, is kale. So I'm thinking that I could even leave the roots in for the winter, but I may be forced to take them out when I replant next summer, simply due to planter space. Um, do you think it's worth it? So you can leave those roots in. So I, um, well, when I grow kale, I grow them all season and the roots, the stumps get to be like a couple inches wide. Um, and you can leave those in because when you plant next season, all you have to do is plant a couple inches over. You can plant directly beside that old root stump because all that thing is going to do is it's just going to break down over time. It's not going to, it's not living. And if it is living, you can kill it off if you want, if it comes back next winter or next spring, sorry. Um, but all it's going to do is break down over time. So you can plant directly beside that and your plants will be totally fine. If anything, it might be good for them because there's bacteria that are probably hanging around those old plant roots um, and providing some benefits to your new plants. Um, so yeah, you can leave those roots in and they'll break down over time eventually. Um, it speeds up in the summer with temperature and moisture. Breakdown happens faster. So in come spring after the winter, they might still be pretty present. But as the season goes on, they'll break down faster and faster. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yes, okay. Um, I guess I have a kind of follow-up question to that too. Because no dig farming, when you actually look at like being in the ground and having all of these like worms and organisms like in the ground, how does that really transfer to a pot? Like, should people put worms in their planters? Uh, depending where they get their soil, they might have some worms in their planters already. Mm. Um, but I mean, bacteria do the bulk of the work. Um, they're really the, the main decomposers and nutrient freer uppers <laughs> in the soil. Um, the worms do a lot, but they're more so doing um, like big movements and kind of larger soil structure um, processes. Uh, but bacteria are the really, the really workhorses of your system and they're gonna be present everywhere um, in pots or in raised beds or in the ground. Um, yeah. Is there a way to increase your bacteria count in like a potted plant? Yeah, um, moisture and temperature are the two most critical factors for bacteria. Um, so um, keeping your soil well moist, but to the point of you're properly watering your plants, obviously. Um, and then, I mean, temperature you can't really do anything about because it's just by nature. <laughs> um, but yeah, moisture. And then just, again, creating that system of leaving your plant roots in, creating healthy living plants that are exudating carbon and molecules into the soil, which are feeding your bacteria. Um, yeah. I guess you could even put mulch around your, maybe not yeah. for, not for weed suppression, but maybe just for like more temperature kind of. Temperature and moisture. Um, mm -hmm. So like I have in my little pots up front right now, um, I have some reject tomato plants and I have straw nestled around them. And that's mostly for moisture. So they don't dry out in the super heat. Um, uh, but straw on top is going to cool your soil down. So if you're planting things that like cooler soil, like say broccoli or cabbage or cauliflower, straw is good for cooling your soil down and then keeping moisture in. If you want your soil to be hotter, you want to take off the straw or like thin it out and make it less because the direct sun is what's going to heat up your soil. Cool. Thank you. Does anyone else have one last question for Michael? I think we're gonna wrap it up. Um, but in the meantime, while someone is typing the last question or wants to unmute themselves, um, I did promise you uh, all a code and I'm putting it in the chat right now. So this is a promo code for anyone who's a new sign up for YYC Growers. Um, and it's just YYC education, all one word, um, and you'll get 10 bucks off your subscription if you sign up. Um, so just wanted to put that in there and say thank you everyone for coming. Any last questions? <gasps> Teresa, um, is there somewhere citizens of Calgary can get free tree bark for the pathways? So there's a few options. Uh, there's a service called Chip Drop, 
which the results may vary and they are very clear about that on their website. So watch the video. Um, but chip drop is an option. It's tripdrop.com, I think. You can look it up. I can type it in. Um, That's a mouthful, um, chipdrop.com. Chipdrop.com. Yeah. Uh, that one you can get free mulch from just arborists. We'll just randomly give you it. But watch the video. Pay attention to what they say. Edmonton also, I think, has the same thing. Um, you can also just call around or email some arborists in your city. Just look up arborists on Google and find a bunch of them, give them a call, send them an email, be like, hey, I'm looking for some mulch. Um, you can even be like, I'll offer you 25 bucks and they'll drop off like five yards of mulch for you. <laughs> um, so it's a pretty good way to get cheap or free mulch that way. Um, and then I think the city might also give some at certain times. Um, yeah, but I don't know how many pine needles or stuff it is. When you want to get mulch, it doesn't matter what type of wood you have, or at least I don't think it does. Um, but you don't want to have pine needles in your mulch because those are just a little bit too acidic and they take a lot. Spruce wood is fine, pine wood is fine. You just don't want needles in your mulch. Cool. Well, thank you. Um, oh, City of Calgary allows you to pick up chips from yeah. the dump at any time. Who thought you'd be going to the dump to get stuff? You know? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'll let everyone start enjoying their beautiful sunny day. I'm sure Michael has to get back to, back to his plots. Um, so thank you, Michael, for, for teaching everybody about no dig farming and inspiring people and getting people to start their own. That's it's really awesome and getting people to look after the soil. Um, so yeah, we're just going to sign off and uh, have an awesome rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>